So when you first read the script, uh, the, the, the current script that ultimately uh, was this movie, what was your first take on it, and what was the thing about Porik that struck you the most? My first take was concern. Um, <laughs> not the answer you're expecting, perhaps. But I, I had read an earlier incarnation about seven years um, before, about seven years ago, Martin had sent me an email and he sent Brendan an email saying, this is something I wrote, something I'm thinking of doing, tell me what you think. I thought it was great, he says it was shit. He obviously holds himself to a higher standard than I do. Um, I was ready to do that film. Then years later, you know, five years later, this version came and it was the first couple of pages remained the same, basically the concept that one friend decided to tell another friend that he didn't like him anymore and that their friendship was dead. That remained the same, but the rest of the script was incredibly different. And Martin went from the one that I read initially being more plot driven and there was more action scenes and there was shootouts. And to be honest with you, my character was a bit cooler. <laughs> and wasn't... Yeah, yeah he's not cool that in this. I know, I know. And What's wasn't, the opposite of cool? He with? wasn't as deeply lonely and he wasn't as... He had a simplicity to him, but he wasn't as simple as lovely Porik um, is. And so when I read it, honest to God, I was kind of like, oh my God, how am I going to, oh God, it's so, I, I, I limped away from reading it. I was ultimately very moved by it because it is at its core to me, a, sto a story about loneliness and about regret and about community, of course, and, and it, it has a certain existential rub at its center. But yeah, concern, just could I, could I do it and not be dull as dishwater for an hour and a half was basically the issue. <laughs> Martin, what was, why did you not like the, the one that you sent to Colin seven years ago, the script, and, and then how did it evolve from something that was maybe a little bit more like in Bruges to something that was much more of a character study? Um, uh, it, 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 it was just, it, the things that I like about this one just weren't really there. It, it, it focused on... It started off with 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 the breakup, and then just went to there were outside characters who came in, and um, uh, it 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 just become became plotty and and wasn't about the relationship anymore. Um, it didn't reach the emotional depths that this does. N yeah, not not even close because it wasn't about the two of you. I think yeah. so. So so I'd literally just f had forgotten about it. The entire story scrapped it and didn't didn't think about it. But then I reread it sort of by accident three years ago. And um, uh, and did like the first five pages, which are pretty much the same as, as the first five minutes here. But then everything else is 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 new. Everything else is just focusing on the sadness of, of a breakup, really. And I was sort of in a breakup-y kind of situation back then too, and just trying to explore the sadness of that, you know, as as deeply sad as those things can be from both sides, you know, from, you know, in, in some ways, uh, Brendan's character is in a sad place too, probably not quite as sad as, as, as Colin's, but um, th there's often something terribly sad about being in a position where you have to break up with someone too. Um, but uh, none of, I think, the, the artistic integrity angle was in the original script too, and I think that's kind of what makes this what it is. And did you, were you writing with all four of the, of the principals in mind? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, I'd wanted to get Colin and Brendan back together since, since in Bruges days. We'd always stayed in touch and we did Seven Psychos together. Um, but it wasn't like we were phoning, phoning each other up saying, <laughs> when's this going to happen? But it was just lingering, definitely. Me and Brendan were phoning each other. <laughs> when's, he gonna, the when's he going to sit down on his ass? He's going to stop going on five-star holidays and write something. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I do my best writing. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, to, to get the boys back, uh, it was always, always, you know, there. Um, but also, the, it's written for Kerry Condon and Barry Keoghan, too. Um, Kerry, I think, is amazing in it. She, we worked together 20 years ago. She was in one of my play, stage plays, Lieutenant Vinish Moore, in the UK, as a 19-year-old, I think. Um, so she, so I've, I've known how brilliant she's, she is, as, as Colin did a couple of films with her, I think, way back then. We've known how great she is, but it's never quite been... Um, uh, uh, explored so much on, on on movie. She's done great TV work too. But um, so that that was written for her to to show exactly how brilliant she is, and she knocked it out of the park. 
Uh, and Barry Kogan too, I didn't really know him before, but um, he's just heartbreaking and perfect in this, I think. What is your, when you're working together, I think part of the pull of this movie is that, that we don't know that much about the characters, just the, the biographical details of these. And when you're, first of all, Colin, when, you're, when you take on a character, how much work do you do on filling in any backstory that's not there in the script? I mean, Porrick's backstory, it depends. It, it, it changes gig to gig, uh, character to character. Um, I love that we were dropped in right at the start of this, and I think somehow by doing that, I, I'm sure this wasn't your intention, maybe it was, but I, don't, I think Martin bypassed any kind of prejudice that the audience could possibly have or could cultivate as a result of finding out who these people were or what they're like in their daily lives. We meet these two humans. Essentially, we all know we're versions of each other anyway, all eight billion of us. We're all versions of each other in greater or lesser degrees. So you kind of meet it with an open, unbiased mind and heart, I think. And the central thing, then allegiance may begin to present itself over the telling of the story. An audience member might find that they sympathize with Porig, and then they might find that maybe Porig is being a little bit too much and he needs to shush now, Porig. Shush. I'd shush. Yeah, I'd shush if I were you. Shush. Because it's serious. And because Brendan's character is going through an awful, awful kind of psychological and emotional time in his life. So I, I, it, was never, it was never glib to me, you know. I love... I did a little bit of backstory, but the beautiful thing about Porig was... As much backstory as you needed, you get in the first 60 seconds. You see that he was a young man, well, young man, that's my denial. <laughs> I'll, I'll try that again. You see the Porg is a middle-aged man, <laughs> defeated, who's walking across the island on the way to meet his friend, and he looks like he might have just won the lottery. You know, he's so happy and content and connected, and he's looking up at the sky and the clouds and the formation of them. He's looking at the tall grass and listening to the waves gently crash against, you know, the, the shoreline. And he just connected, pure and connected, simple, doesn't want much for life, not ambitious, not an ideologue, nothing. And he comes over the crest, and that's all you need to know. And then the rest of it for me was the disintegration of that joy and the loss of that innocence over the next 90 minutes. So that Porig ended up at the end, somebody who believing that there is a place for violence in the world and that it doesn't even need to be justified and that man is essentially cruel and dark and he can't find any of the joy that he once had in his life. And they're both cursed. They're both cursed. And I wouldn't even blame Colm in the end of the film. You know, they're both cursed by the confusions that can, can plague us just by virtue of being human and wondering what our purpose is and how, how our lives can be justified. And Martin, do you have full biographical details in your head when you're writing? Does it, does it come to yeah. you? Do you create that? I'm so obviously Still curious about them. your creative <laughs> process. Absolutely none. <laughs> Literally, I've just, whatever's on the page is all I've got. You know, um, I, I don't really do that. Backstory. Uh, all the all the actors I worked with kind of know that it's kind. I think it's a good thing, or it could be a really really lazy thing. But um, it's I kind of think it's for the actor to come come with or be free to come with that sort of stuff. Um, and you're not you're not big on outlines and things like that, or maybe you are sometimes. But my understanding is with this one. You really started and discovered it as you went along. Yeah, and that's that's been the same with all the plays and all the f uh, all the screenplays too. I never outline and never know where it's going, never know the ending. Usually, just have a, one or two characters and start from there. Um, and this was the same as Jenny, that. Jenny and Minnie. Jenny and <laughs> yeah, ben. donkey and a horse. How can we get it financed, <laughs> Colin and Brenda? Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but but no, because you don't know, because I don't know what's going to happen when Brendan comes into the pub and makes a threat. That surprised me, you know, as much as it did anyone else, because I didn't know he was going to do great. that. That's great. I love that idea of you with a pen and paper, or whatever. Were you pen and paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pen and paper. It would be his pen and paper, and writing column comes into the pub, and literally not knowing, and then going, <gasps> ah, and well, I love that idea. That's so lovely. Yeah, so pure. it is. It is. But and then it for then it gives you sort of the next thirty minutes of, sure. of, of the film because it's you know how are we going to deal with that. But it, there's a joy not to know that kind of stuff. Is there a quickening after that moment? After yeah, the every, everything the next starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, that's you're cool. Just trying to keep up after that. Point. Oh, that's cool. I am. Um, I saw Sam Rockwell in the lobby. Is he? Where's Sammy? He, where is he? Oh, hey, where, where was that? Hey, Poopy. Hey, baby. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Yeah, did you? He said he had a question, and I promised. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> hey, <Leslie. laughs> 
<laughs> Obviously for Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> you know me, What's your favorite crab service snack? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy at this stage. Yeah. No, seriously, what, um, how was the rehearsal process for this? Was it, was it useful? Was it uh, sort of like, uh, let's get on with it? Or what, what? No, it was. I, I, um, Honestly, I had an awful amount of fear around it, Sambo. I, I, I really did. And I, you know, we all got in. It was amazing because I feel there was a kind of a confluence of things that were happening. There is, what do you call yourself? London Irish, British Irish? Not that yeah. you need to call yourself anything, but yeah. London Irish. So anyway, we'll just say at least 50%, right? But by, by genealogical bloodline, he's an Irishman and he grew up in London, etc. But we don't claim ownership, but we're very proud of him at home as well. And Brendan, we love at home. I've done okay and I'm an Irishman. And so we were all going home to tell a very Irish story in an incredibly Irish place, if I can say such a thing and not sound like an interloper. Um, the West Coast and, you know, Inishmore and Ackle Island, as he said. So there was this sense of coming together. We rehearsed in the Druid Theatre rehearsal space where Martin put on the Beauty Queen of Lanan all those years where they rehearsed and workshopped your first yeah. play. I yeah. mean, that was a huge kind of full circle. So the first day we were in there for a table read and we were all really nervous and really excitement, excited. And then, yeah, it was trying to get to, how you know yourself, man, sometimes the way something, when you read it, you may love it, but it may seem so heightened that it's way beyond your reach. And the process and rehearsal for me on this was trying to just bridge the gap, close the gap between how heightened and how painful and how funny sometimes you want to get inured to the comedy so that you're playing it, you're never playing it. I mean, you're never playing it for laughs anyway, but it's so funny, the stuff that he writes. And it's like this process in rehearsal where the humor gets less and less the more you look at it and the pain gets more and more and more. And then you go and you put it in front of a camera and the audience sees and the humor is still there, but only because you're actually tending to the other stuff. And so I, I loved, I mean, by the time we were finished the rehearsal, I was chomping at the bit and ready to go, but, um, but loved that part of the process, really did. I want to thank you both for the movie. I want Thanks. to congratulate you on the movie. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, for Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks a minute.